In 2008, Alex Ovechkin signed the largest contract in hockey history, 13 years for $124 million. It's good to be old. However, most hockey players will never see this level of money in their entire career. This is because hockey is a sport built on a tier system, with the highest being the NHL and the lowest being juniors. From around the ages of 16 to 20, the most elite prospects are joining junior league teams. OHL priority selection, Michael Misa from the Mississauga Senators. In Canada, you can expect the best of the best to be playing in the CHL which consists of three leagues, the OHL, WHL, and QMJHL. The CHL is classified as a professional league, meaning if you play one game in the CHL, you lose your NCAA eligibility and can never play D1 hockey, while other junior leagues are classified as amateur, so players who play in the USHL can go on to play D1 college hockey. And on top of that, junior players have to move to whatever city their new team is in. The players move in with a host family they've most likely never met before, and their life becomes hockey and school. Players can then be traded at any point, and they'll have to pack up and move in with a new host family. I say all this to give you the stakes that these 16-year-olds are playing with. It's definitely not a normal childhood. And the players don't get paid a salary. Instead, they get free equipment, free housing, scholarships, and a weekly stipend of maybe $50 to $150. Players and juniors are allowed to take endorsements and pursue sponsorships. And while this is going to be very difficult for the average player to get, giant deals do happen. Like Connor McDavid signed a multi-million dollar deal with Reebok at just the age of 15. The other way junior players can make money is to be drafted in the NHL. Which I know sounds funny, but it's true because if they get drafted in the NHL and get assigned to playing in juniors, they don't get their NHL contract but they do get their signing bonus, which can be up to $92,000. So to sum it up, if you're a junior league player playing for the Halifax Mooseheads, you could be playing in front of 8,000 paying fans every home game, and you'll have to find other ways than making a salary to make substantial money. Most players who don't go the CHL route end up going to college. And just a couple of years ago, this would have been a very short segment. But this all changed on July 21st, 2021, when the NCAA approved the Name, Image, and Likeness Policy or NIL. This now allows players to make money from things like endorsements or selling merchandise. However, there have already been criticisms that it's more like straight payments to the players rather than endorsements. But I'll leave it at that for now. The biggest NIL deals so far have been in college football. Alabama's starting quarterback Bryce Young has starred in Dr. Pepper commercials. Hey buddy, what are you doing here? Hey, go state. You replaced me with star quarterback Bryce Young. We could never replace you. Here's your Dr. Pepper. And all his endorsements combined have netted him somewhere around $3 million. Not bad for a college athlete. But what does this mean for hockey? Well, it's a bit tricky to say, because there have only been a few public deals with large companies. Like, Dunkin' Donuts signed one male and one female hockey player, and BioSteel signed four women hockey players, and they said they were going to make a commercial with two of them. Open Doors, a platform that connects college athletes with potential sponsors, estimates the average D1 college athlete has made around $3,700 from NIL endorsements. The website has many college hockey players on it, and the average price for a custom video is about $11 and around $50 for an appearance. So while we know NIL deals are happening in college hockey, they're nowhere near as big as football and it's hard to know exactly how much players are making, and with how new the NIL landscape is, it'll be really interesting to me to see how the average pay for college hockey players changes over the next couple of years. And I'll be really curious to see if players decide to play in college instead of the CHL so they can make more money, and how will the CHL deal with this? Slovakian national team and TPS Turku, Yuri Slavkovsky. Once drafted or signed with an NHL team, the organization then has to decide where to put the player. NHL teams have two minor league teams below them, the AHL, the second tier, and the ECHL, the third tier. Or so I thought, because I had always assumed that NHL teams actually own their minor league affiliates. But that's not always the case. For the AHL, about 20 out of the 32 teams are owned and operated by their NHL affiliate but 12 of them are owned by completely separate ownership groups. And the ECHL is even more disconnected with zero teams being owned by their NHL affiliate, which leads to frequent affiliation changes between ECHL and NHL teams, and some NHL teams don't even have an ECHL affiliate. It also seems that very few players are swapped between the NHL's organization's roster and the ECHL's roster. So most players who are on an ECHL team 
are actually signed to that specific ECHL team, not the NHL affiliate. Let's take a look at the Detroit Red Wings organization. The NHL team is owned by Chris Illich. Their AHL team, the Grand Rapids Griffins, is owned by Dan DeVos. And their ECHL team, the Toledo Walleye, are owned by Toledo Arena Sports Inc. All three teams are owned by different owners, but they work together due to their affiliation with one another. Looking at the Toledo Walleyes roster, out of the 27 players listed on the team, only three of them are actually signed to the Red Wings organization. The rest are signed directly with the Walleye. The players who actually signed with the Detroit Red Wings are going to make their agreed upon minor league salary, while the rest of the players who are on ECHL specific contracts will make much less. The ECHL has a very strange salary structure, where each team has a weekly salary cap of $14,100. The league has a salary minimum for $510 for rookies and $555 for returning players per week, which means if a player plays the entire season in the ECHL, they'll make around $20,000. Due to the low salaries, ECHL teams do supply housing for the players, but it's still a very low amount of money, and a lot of players end up working summer jobs. Then we get to the AHL. There's three types of contracts you'll see in the AHL, the first one being one-way NHL contracts. These are contracts for players who make the same amount of money in the NHL as they do in the AHL, so they're typically only given to players who are they're planning to keep up in the NHL, because it guarantees the player gets at least the NHL salary minimum, which is $750,000. The most famous example of one-way contracts in the NHL being played in the AHL was when Wade Redden was making $6.5 million to play for the Hartford Wolfpack. And while that's definitely not normal, it can and has happened. Other players, particularly every player signing an entry-level contract, are signing two-way contracts. These contracts have two different salaries, one for the NHL and one for the AHL. In the 2021 NHL draft, the Seattle Kraken selected Matty Beneers second overall. Now let's look at his contract. His NHL base salary is $832,000 per year. But if he was sent to the AHL, this would go all the way down to $80,000 which is less than 10% of his NHL contract. Players can also sign one-way AHL contracts, and if they were called up to the NHL, they would have to sign a new contract with the NHL team. And these contracts are for lower amounts of money, with the league minimum being for $51,000. So in the AHL, you can have people playing against each other who are making $1 million versus $51,000. And typically, the best prospects are making around $80,000. It really all depends on what type of contract they have. Moving up to the NHL, we see the salaries boom. This is thanks to an increase in ticket sales, and most importantly, selling TV broadcasting rights. ESPN pays the NHL $400 million, which allows teams to in turn pay their players more. Entry-level contracts have a maximum of $925,000. Up to $2.85 million of performance bonuses can be tacked on on top of that. There's also an NHL league minimum which is $750,000, but that's just the minimum. The average salary in the NHL is between three and $3.5 million, with 70% of the players making more than a million dollars per year. The largest current contract in the NHL is no surprise. It's Connor McDavid with $100 million for eight years. For comparison, in 1979, Wayne Gretzky signed a 10-year, $3 million contract. Also, players can and do make money from endorsements. Ovechkin actually makes the most money out of all NHL players on endorsements. He starred in legendary Papa John's commercials like this. Beats is here. Beats is here. And even more legendary CCM commercials like this. No one ever got better at hockey by bowling. Forbes estimates he makes around $5 million from his endorsements alone. And even really the average NHL player is making a lot of money. What did surprise me though, is how when you go down the ladder, how little money minor league players are actually making. And let me know what you think about juniors and college players making money. I'm really curious what you guys think about that. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe if you want to see more NHL content like this.